Part one ended with the question, whatever happened to John Morthland? He was the San Bernardino High School student reporter who interviewed the Rolling Stones backstage prior to their October 31, 1964 Swing Auditorium appearance. Fifty-five years after the concert, Inland Empire journalist David Allen reported on what became of John Morthland. Morthland became a staff writer for the Sun newspaper in 1966. By 1969, he was a writer for Rolling Stone, the counterculture music magazine. He later became an associate editor for the publication. Perhaps his highest profile reporting for the magazine was in 1969, when he again crossed paths with the Rolling Stones. Mortland was among a team of writers that covered the violence that marred the Altamont Festival where the Stones were headliners. In 1974, Mortland left Rolling Stone for another music magazine, Cream. He eventually became an editor of the publication. After he left Cream, he became a freelance writer contributing to numerous music publications. In 1985, he authored a book, The Best of Country Music. Around the same time, he moved his base of operations to Austin, Texas, and its thriving music scene. In the mid-80s, Mortland became a writer-at-large for Texas Monthly, where he continued writing until his passing in March 2016 at the age of 68. After Mortland died, Rolling Stone magazine made note of his various contributions to the publication, such as his coverage of the Altamont Festival, the Kent State shootings, and Jimi Hendrix's funeral. John Morthland wasn't the only Inland Empire High School journalist that interviewed the Stones backstage in 1964. Joe Striggle and Mike Peters of Eisenhower High School in Rialto also were there. Their impressions of the band went as follows. Brian Jones seemed to be more interested in his appearance than the other ones. Smoking a cigar, he gave us the impression of being high class. His hair looked the best of the group. When asked to whom he owed his success, he implied that he had the rest of the group to thank for it. We like the honest answer of Keith Richards, who said he thought his music could be better. Keith looked the most different in person because his hair is jet black. In most of his pictures, his hair is brownish. We consider him best looking. Mick Jagger had the look of responsibility and didn't seem to want to be bugged. He said that they were soon to make a movie in England. Charles Watts seemed to move mechanically and showed no expression. He answered most questions with, I don't know. We consider him most humble and felt sorry for him because he looked so lonely. Our favorite of the group was Bill Wyman. He had an air of friendliness and gave us special cooperation and attention. He had the best sense of humor. When asked what he thought of British teens compared to American teens, he said, well, they're the same age. According to various online set lists, these are the 10 songs performed by the Stones at the swing. Nine of them were cover songs and one was an original. The covers were originally recorded by Buddy Holly, Irma Thomas, Bo Diddley, Bobby Womack, Wilson Pickett, Slim Harpo, Walter Brown and Jay McShann, and two by Chuck Berry. The original was Tell Me, composed by Jagger and Richards. In this Daily Sun photo, it can be seen that the mostly female audience was enraptured by the Rolling Stones' performance with the possible exception of the young man in the center of the picture, who looked visibly stunned by the experience. In a November 3, 1964 Sun article, San Bernardino County Sheriff's Lieutenant Eugene L. Majors was interviewed. He led a team of 30 officers providing security at the Stones concert. In part, the article read, The officers raised the stage, set out a 20-foot no-man's land in front, placed the front row well out of reach of the stand, and warned they would stop the show if trouble began. Well briefed on the sheriff's tactics, 
The Rolling Stones apparently gave one of their best performances under a satisfying shield of the law. We were concerned about getting the musicians away from the Oring Show grounds, Majors added, but we solved that problem with a little subterfuge. When the last loud note sounded, the quintet dashed from the stage and disappeared out a rear entrance as the youngsters pressed the pursuit. Well, we got them into a private car and on their way before the teenagers knew what happened, Majors added. Most of the enthusiastic audience had crowded around the bus in which the five performers arrived, but the private car technique for the departure apparently spoiled the deluge. The last word on the Halloween concert occurred in the November 12, 1964 editorial page of the Daily Sun. Penny Sieber of Redlands wrote, Editor of the Sun-Telegram, Thank you so much for the two wonderful articles on the Rolling Stones. They were really fab, and it was great of you not to chop them, as many magazines and other newspapers have. The whole thing was the gear. The Rolling Stones would return to play the Swing Auditorium two more times, in May of 1965 and July of 1966, for a total of four appearances at the Hall. The group wanted to return for a fifth visit during their fall 1981 U.S. tour. However, their representatives were told that the swing was not available, having fallen victim to a private plane crash in September 1981.
the new album. I sent it from another album. <coughs> They're all good. Shut up. <laughs> new music from the dangers. I'm <laughs> Sid and Marty Croft, HR Puff and Stuff is now available to buy and own on video. Pretend that you're buying it for your children. You know they'll love it as much as you did for the fun. Everybody talks here on Living Island. The humour. This is your gorgeous leader. The colourful characters. It's simply great fun for the whole family. Pretend as much as you like, but give it to the kids to watch sometimes. Available for all good video retailers at $19.95.
Yo.